Hi book lovers! Welcome back to my channel. Historical Romance Readathon has officially ended and unfortunately I did not vlog. Instead I'm just gonna sit here and talk about the seven books that I read over the past week. If you didn't know, this is a readathon that I co-host with my friends Jessica from Peace Love Books and Lisa from Remarkably Lisa. This is our second time doing it in 2021 and if you follow us on Instagram you probably saw that we had giveaways for every single day of the readathon. They are still open they're open until this Wednesday, July 7th. So if you haven't entered and you want to enter to win some historical romances, go check out our Instagram pages. For the readathon, I ended up reading seven books, four in audio and three with the ebook slash paperback. Mostly with the ebooks because even if I own a book in paperback, I'm gonna try to get the ebook mostly through my library just because I read so much faster with ebooks. And plus, I do love highlighting on my Kindle. I also had five more books that I I didn't get to on my TBR but I didn't really expect to get to them. I for sure overestimated myself when I created my TBR but I still got to seven books which is not bad at all. Seven books in seven days, practically a book a day, and most of them were pretty good reads mostly in the four-ish star range. I did have one dud though which I'll get into a little bit later. If you did join us this round for historical romance readathon let me know what you guys read. I've been trying to keep up with everyone's posts on Instagram, everyone's vlog, on YouTube and it always amazes me when people join us for this readathon so thank you thank you so much. The first book that I read for historical romance readathon was our group read Olivia and the Mass Duke by Grace Calloway. This one I had to read first because I was gonna do a live with Grace Calloway on that Tuesday of the readathon week so I needed to be able to talk to her at least a little bit about this book and if you're interested in watching that live it is saved on my Instagram IGTV so go check it out it was so much fun talking to her. So Olivia and the Mass Duke is book one in Lady Charlotte's Society of Angels series. It's her newest series. It just came out earlier this year in February and I had had my eye on it ever since it released. So when Jessica and Lisa were like, what book should we read for this round? What should our group buddy read be? I just threw this at them and they said yes. I really enjoyed this one. This is probably one of the better books that I read this week. I gave it four stars. It was really sweet and really fun. If you couldn't tell from the series title, Lady Charlotte's Charlotte's Society of Angels. It is a play on Charlie's Angels, which I was a dummy dumb and didn't even realize. It only clicked when Grace Calloway said it herself during our live, and I even told her, wow, I did not make that connection. Luckily, I was not alone with this, even though it seems so obvious after the fact, but Lisa also <laughs> did not realize it was Charlie's Angels either. And of course, we have our girl group here who gets inducted into that secret society. We have Libby, our heroine, and her two best friends, Fiona and Glory. They call themselves the Willflowers, which is a play on Wallflowers, which I thought was really cute. These three like to speak their minds and do their own thing. For Livy's romance, we have an age gap and a friends to lovers romance. Livy and Ben have a 12 year age gap and they've known each other ever since he saved her when she was a little girl. He saved her life and ever since then they are good friends. I did not think there was any sort of creepiness factor. He literally sees her as his younger sister for a very, very long time. And when she is all grown up, up, she is actually the one who is the pursuer. She knows she's in love with him and that he's the only one for her so she goes and tries to get Ben to fall back in love with her. So unrequited love is not my favorite thing to read mainly because I really get annoyed when the heroine is always just pining around just waiting for the hero and not really doing anything about it and luckily this wasn't the case in this book. Libby is very determined to win Ben's heart and in the meantime she also joins Lady Charlotte's Society of Angels and learns how to use a gun, use a sword, she learns how to fight, protect herself. The whole point of the society is to help women in need. So there's never really a dull moment in this book. There's either the romance or this whole mystery element to the book. There's this lethal drug that's been distributing around London. It's related to opium. It's been killing its users and both Livy and Ben are trying to track down who's in charge of this drug distribution. I thought the romance was so sweet, especially the friends to lovers part. I love their friendship. For me, the pacing from friendship to more to lovers felt very natural and I was just loving how much they loved and cared about each other so much. It does get very steamy, of course. It is Grace Calloway if you have 
have read her before, you know she writes some hot historical romances. It wasn't the perfect read, there might have been a little bit too many things going on at times, but I had a lot of fun reading this. I'm always a sucker for a dark and broody hero who has a tortured past and has a very tortured past. So this was great, I really enjoyed it, and if you didn't know, Livy is actually the daughter of one of Grace Calloway's previous couples, one of the books in the Heart of Inquiry series. I'm not exactly sure which one. I think the first book, but I need to read that whole series. I've heard really great things about it, and I'm also excited for more of the Lady Charlotte series. Pippa, who is another friend of theirs, she's actually book two. She is a widow. She becomes widowed in book one. My second read for the readathon was If the Duke Demands by Anna Harrington. This one I had to read because both Lisa and Jessica love this one. They both gave it five stars, but I gave it four. It was a four star read, mainly because the hero got a little bit frustrating and I wanted more from the end. But I love the beginning. I thought it was so cute and I thought it was so funny how our heroine Miranda, she she believes she's in love with this boy that she grew up with, so she decides to seduce him at this masquerade ball. And it being a masquerade ball, of course, we get mistaken identities. Miranda shows up in Robert's room, Robert finally shows up, and they start getting it on. But it turns out it's not Robert, it's actually his older brother, his older Duke brother, Sebastian. It doesn't turn into a marriage of convenience, though, they do not get caught, and instead both of them make a little deal with each other. Miranda will help Sebastian find his perfect wife, and Sebastian will help Miranda win Robert's heart. I love reading historical romances that have characters from two different social classes. Here we have a Duke hero and he falls for his tenant farmer's daughter and her being who she is, he can't marry her. He has this idea in his mind because of his dad passing away that he has to marry a lady, someone proper, someone from the right class who will be the perfect duchess. And this got kind of annoying to read, I'm not gonna lie. He goes on and on and on about it. He hurts Miranda because of this over and over. So I got frustrated with Sebastian because he just was too into his head about marrying someone proper. Miranda is a really sweet heroine. She is very surprised when she ends up falling for the other brother, but when she does realize that she's in love with Sebastian, she doesn't waffle between him or Robert. She knows that Sebastian is it for her. The romance is really sweet and fun, don't get me wrong. Like when things are good between these two, I was just cheesing and smiling, but then at the end, Sebastian makes this really big mistake and he has to grovel, right? He really, really hurt Miranda, so I expected more groveling and for Miranda to take a little bit more time to take him back, but she just took him back immediately. So the ending was a bit of a letdown, which is why this is four stars, even though I did want to give it five stars so that we would have, so me, at least then Jessica, would have another five star book between us. I'm not sure I'll continue with the series though. It's the first book in the Capturing the Carlisle series and I didn't really care about Sebastian's brothers, but it was still a really good read. My next read was Ravished by Amanda Quick. This one, I've got the copy with the step back and I have mentioned in my review on Goodreads in my historical romance reader book tag video that I expected this book to be a lot darker and more intense than it was and I'm thinking it's because of the step back that I thought that. I don't know about you but this step back is giving me dark almost gothic vibes. I love it though it's by Pino who is such an iconic step back artist. So this book was not dark and intense it was really fun and almost lighthearted at times. It reminded me a lot of Lord of Scandrels when it came to the banter between our main characters. There's also a marriage of convenience here as well and it's a bit of a retelling of Beauty and the Beast because we have a beastly, scarred, reclusive hero. Our heroine Harriet is a paleontologist, which means that she is obsessed with bones. She loves to discover and uncover bones, especially in this cave in their small town. Unfortunately for her, she has discovered that some thieves have taken over her caves. These thieves have been stealing valuables from people and hiding them in the caves and selling them off to make a profit, and Harriet decides to get in contact with Gideon who is a Viscount and the owner of the land that she lives on to get this problem fixed. Gideon is very much a reclusive hero. Everyone believes that he killed his fiance, his pregnant fiance. He has a giant scar on his face and everyone just avoids him. So Harriet is nothing like he expects. She doesn't cower away from him. She's not afraid of him. Literally all she wants is for him to get rid of the thieves so that she can continue excavating her bones. I had so much fun with these two right from the start. I love 
love the cute banter, the witty banter between them. Gideon is all sarcastic with his dry humor. Harriet is so sassy and stubborn and strong. These two made a very, very great couple. I just love that Gideon was so taken away and taken aback by Harriet and it was so easy to see why these two fell for each other. But before they do, they find themselves compromised. Harriet finds herself trapped in the caves because of the tides. Gideon goes in to save her and they have to stay overnight in those caves. This is so sweet. I give it four stars, maybe four and a half. I was not like mind blown away from it, but it was a fantastic read, a very solid read, especially for my first Amanda Quick book. I was just swooning over Gideon, being so protective over Harriet, so caring and adoring of her. The whole side plot with the mystery was really entertaining to read, not just with the cave thieves, but with someone going after both Harriet and Gideon. It was a delightful read, and I am so excited to read more from Amanda Quick. My next read was For the Duke's Eyes Only by Lenora Bell. It's book two in the School for Duke series. I have read one book in the series before. It was book three, so I have been reading the series completely out of order. But this was the one that Lisa loved and Lisa recommended, so I figured why not? Let's give it a try. And funny enough, the heroine here is an archaeologist, so it was fun reading about heroines who were archaeologists and a paleontologist back to back. This book I gave a three and a half stars, maybe 3.75, like it's very close to a four, just not quite there. I am such a sucker for a childhood friends to lovers romance and even better, a childhood friends to enemies to lovers romance. Indy and Daniel were best friends growing up as children, but when Daniel's father passes away and Daniel becomes the new duke, he is sent away. Even though they do promise each other that they're gonna marry each other, Daniel ends up hurting India, pushing her away, purposely breaking her heart, and now she hates him. Unfortunately for India, Daniel is back in her life now and she has to team up with him in order to find the missing slash stolen Rosetta Stone. I was really enjoying this one and I was loving the tension between these two because there is a lot of complicated and unfinished feelings between each other, but these two kind of fell into bed really quickly and it just became like all about the lust between them and nothing else. There's a slight confrontation about what happened all those years ago, why Daniel broke India's heart. Turns out he is more than just a scoundrel, a rake, and an antiquities hunter. He has quite a lot of secrets that he's been keeping from India, but once they fall into bed, I felt like the romance just wasn't as gripping or addicting anymore. I wanted more angst, I wanted them to explore more about the hurt that was caused, all the lingering anger, but it fizzles out around halfway through and that's when the whole heist, trying to find the artifact thing comes into play, but that whole aspect wasn't as exciting as I was hoping it would be. Things wrap up really easily and quickly at the end, which is why I definitely preferred the first half of this book to the second half. I then read two more books by Grace Calloway, the second and third book in the Mayhem and Mayfair series. Book two is Her Wanton Wager, which is so far my favorite of the series. I give it four stars. Here we have a darker scoundrel type hero in Gavin who owns this infamous club an infamous gaming hell. He's on a quest for revenge against the man who ruined his life when he was a boy. That man he wants revenge against is the hero from book one, Nicholas, and Gavin sets his eyes on Nicholas's kind of brother, Paul, in order to begin his quest for revenge. So now Paul owes a huge debt to Gavin, which is exactly what he wants, and Percy, our heroine, who is also Paul's sister, she decides to rescue Paul. She disguises herself as a man to get into Gavin's club in order to confront him, him, and Gavin is like, well, I know Paul doesn't have a brother, so this must be the sister. Gavin is pretty captivated by Percy as soon as she undoes her disguise, so he offers her a deal. If she can resist his attempts at seducing her for six nights, he'll forget about Paul's debt and let him free. This is a pretty intense and steamy read. I really enjoyed our main characters. The chemistry between them was great. Grace Calloway always includes a lot of mystery and action and suspense in her story. Goals, and that whole side plot I thought was really well done. I love that Percy is a writer. She's an author. She's been working on this manuscript that you get to read at the beginning of each chapter. This was just very enjoyable, a very solid read. And then book three is Her Protector's Pleasure, which I gave three, maybe three and a half stars. I didn't love it quite as much as book two. I just didn't really connect with Marianne and Ambrose as much. They did get a little tease from book two, so I was excited to read their book, but it just fell a little flat for me. 
me. So here we have a wealthy widow who is also a single mother, but her daughter has been kidnapped. Her daughter was not actually her late husband. She got impregnated before she got married and her scumbag husband, right before he died, he ended up taking and selling her daughter away. Ambrose, our hero, is a policeman and his latest assignment is to look into Marianne. Ambrose is very much a good guy hero. He's very honorable, a family man. Everything he does is to take care of his family, of his siblings. And this book is the one that spins off into the Heart of Inquiry series about Ambrose's family, the Kent family. And as soon as Ambrose and Marianne meet, sparks are flying. It's very much insta-lust, but I think the main reason why I couldn't get into this one was that I just didn't really get into the side plot with the kidnapped daughter. I just never found myself all that interested in what Marianne was doing to find her daughter. I mean, I appreciated how strong and resilient she was, but the investigative parts, both the heroines and the heroes, I just couldn't get into. So this one, unfortunately, not my favorite, though I am intrigued now by the Ken family, and I really want to get into Grace Calloway's Heart of Inquiry series. And the last book that I read for the readathon was unfortunately my dud. I did not end this readathon with a bang. My last book and my least favorite book was The Wisteria Society of Lady Scoundrels by India Holton. I gave this one two stars and it was literally because of the writing. The writing was not for me. It was too all over the place. It tried to be too funny, too quirky, which was so disappointing because the actual story and the romance, it had so much potential. If you simplify the story into this lady pirate society where the heroine is a junior member, she knows how to use a gun, a sword, deadly fans. Like these women are so freaking cool. All they do is try to assassinate each other, steal from each other and from other people and just be a lady pirates. There's an assassin hero who's been hired to kill the heroine, but he's also like a spy. And you can tell from the moment that Ned sees Cecilia, he meets her, he can't do it, he can't kill her. So the bare bones of the story was fantastic, it had so much potential. The banter between our main characters is so freaking cute, but the writing, it kind of reads like a movie if that makes sense, like it's describing everything that's going on and it gets to be a lot. And I was actually thinking while I was reading this one that it would make for a really interesting and fun movie, but not quite a good book. especially when the book, this historical romance, takes a humongous turn into something that's almost like steampunk, which I was not expecting at all. I didn't know if I was supposed to have read reviews to know this, but there are literal flying houses in this book. When I read it for the first time, I thought it was a metaphor or something like, oh, she's flying her house, whatever. But no, these characters literally do incantations in order to lift their house into midair and fly them to a different location. Location. I was like, what on earth am I reading? Why do we have flying houses? And there's a lot of chapters that focus on the secondary characters that focus outside of the romance. So this was really disappointing. I love the concept. It was just not executed well enough for me. I mean, it's enemies to lovers between pirates slash thieves slash assassins. And I will say there were some genuinely funny parts, like the humor at times worked really well, but I just could not deal with this writing. Also during our historical romance, Readathon a live show on Lisa's channel. We got into a pretty interesting discussion about trade historical romance paperbacks. It seems like we can't really trust these anymore, the ones that are published by a publisher, not the indie trade paperbacks. I did love Evie Dunmore's debut, Bringing Down the Duke, which was published by the same publisher, Berkeley, in trade paperback, but it seems like everything else, all the other historical romances in trade paperback with the cutesy illustrated covers, they're not working all that well. And the reviews on Goodreads especially are really, really bad. That is everything that I read for Historical Romance Readathon around 2 for 2021. Let me know your thoughts if you have read any of these books. If you have any historical romance recommendations for me, especially ones that you read over the readathon week, let me know. Just a reminder to check out our giveaways on Instagram. As always, links to all the books that I mentioned will be down in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for everyone who joined in the readathon. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.